Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bang On Sale show. Uh, I'm really excited about today's guest. Uh, I'm just going to go jump straight into it. This is Kevin Dixon. He is founder and CEO of Boxstep. How you doing, Kevin? I'm all right. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me, mate. Thanks for coming on. No, I appreciate it. Um, kick things off. Do you want to maybe just introduce yourself? Tell us about you, about Boxstep. Yeah, I'm old. What else do you need to know? Uh, I say that a lot in jest because people sort of been very judgmental in sales, but I've been in sales forever when cold calling was actually physically knocking on a door, not just, uh, you know, doing it on the phone. So, yeah, my background as I spent 20 odd years in like CRO levels in technology, uh, high tech sales software. And then I had a moment where I saw this big growth in the way the number of people get involved in, in buying decisions and start a box step, which is a platform that complements CRM by really turning the sales team's attention on the decision-making team. You know, what do you know about them? How can you help them? And what can you learn from them? And uh, yeah, so it's a fascinating subject. Yeah, yeah. Um, bar enablement. Talk to me about that. What is it? Yeah, it's, it's, not a term, it's not a term I created. You know, Jesus, I, um, it, I think it was Gartner one uh, and it came out. And I think that was one of the moments that, that sort of triggered this about six years ago um, when they started talking about buyer enablement. Well, buyer, every, well, throttle back, sales enablement. Everyone knows about sales enablement. It's the, okay, we're going to go all down the sales enablement road so we can actually improve the way we sell, improve the deal velocity, the close rates and the customer satisfaction, all those different things. The problem is is we can do all we like on the sales side, but if there's a problem on the buying side, a lot of it comes to nothing. And what do I mean by that? Buying's become more difficult. Uh, the way customers decide and buy is far more challenging. And that was what the trigger moment was when Gartner came out with their research. I think it was maybe 2017, where at the time they said there's now 5.4 people involved in the typical buying decision. Uh -huh. uh, roll on a few years and they're saying that's well into double figures. So the, the issue is, is that buyer enablement is about saying, well, look, you've got double figure number of people involved in a buying decision. And we all know the more people involved, the more difficult it is to get them to align. Yeah. Not only do you get them to align, then you get them to actually make a decision. So buyer enablement, how do we turn buyer enablement? There's a different sort of ways that, that people sort of uh, look at this. But in my perspective, it's really about how, helping buyers feel and um, uh, feel confident about making a purchase decision so because uh, there's two things there's getting them to make it and then making sure they don't have buyer's remorse afterwards so yeah, two separate yeah. challenges so so what can we do as sellers to help buyers navigate the complexity of deciding and buying that's how i view uh, buyer enablement okay okay um, I, I guess what you're saying as well, it has a massive implication for the length of sales cycles, right? Because more people, even if they are reaching a decision, it's taking longer. Um, what, what have you seen there? So, yes, it has. Gradually, it's got longer and longer and longer. And there's, there's two things that, that sort of triggered the view that the sellers had to focus on buyer enablement. And that was the number of no decision outcomes that we see in our sales opportunities. I think mm. typical stats tend to say that around about 60 to 70 percent of all of our sales opportunities ends up with the customer doing nothing. And largely, that number has increased as the size of the decision making team buying committee has increased because they say the more people that are going to be involved, the more likely is they'll do nothing. Yeah. And if, if let me try and talk about a root cause problem that we see in no decisions and uh, poor close rates and deal velocity. Sellers don't focus enough on the buying committee. We are humanly attracted to people of authority. You know, we can't help but see power. So, ah, right, let's focus on C-level decision makers, put all our attention there. And we tend to ignore the periphery, the other people. And that, I, think, I can't remember how long ago it was, but the terminology came out many, many years ago. So high, wide and deep. And today that is so true. You have to do that. Because when I talk to uh, key execs, economic buyers, decision makers, they all tell me one thing we don't make a decision 
unless our team's happy with it. So, and largely the decision isn't theirs. What I mean by that is these people are saying, my team's made the decision. All we're doing is signing off on it and checking and validating that they've gone through all the things they need to do before we decide. So that's why I'll say to people that really go high, wide and deep. Think about if you take a typical buying committee, there'll be exec buyers, economic buyers, technical buyers and users. And users, they can be mid to lower level. And as salespeople, we've never really thought, oh, let's focus on mid to lower level. We don't think like that. We want to go high because we think that's where the power base is. That's where we'll have the most influence. Uh, it's a different game now, Mark. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And do you think um, it's not black and white? Uh, you know, there's shades of gray in the sense that I'm guessing the approach evolves as let's say you're selling to a larger, more complex organization or the deal size increases. Um, have you seen any, any trends or are there any patterns in terms of, uh, you know, best practices? So like, you know, as uh, within certain brackets of deal size or complexity that you would take a different approach, let's say a top down versus a bottom up or having a selling committee as well as, you know, to, to, to tackle different levels of that buying committee. Yeah. Well, <laughs> What's interesting is because you see the research that says, you know, what what is the typical size of people based on the size of the deal, the market or the technology? Mm -hmm. I could be doing I've had situations where I'm doing a two thousand dollar annual deal and there'd be five to six people involved yeah. and because it touches them all. My technology touches them. So everyone says, OK, well, let's just check. Let's get their opinion. And so it, it's difficult that I, you know, when I talk to uh, sales teams and I ask them, it, it, I, I get some very strange responses. And sometimes I see organizations that they might be doing seven figure deals, you know, annual license. I ask them how many people are involved in the deal and they'll say four or five. And I, I, I don't want to look at them and say, look, you're crazy. That isn't, that's not going to happen um, because they just assume that is it. And when we actually start to think about it is, by nature now, CFOs involved in nearly every, every deal. Depending on what you're selling, there could be compliance, security, IT, legal, procurement. All these different departments now have, are, are touching the deals we do. We don't always see it. It's not always visible to us. That's why they talk about the buying committee being made up of uh, active and occasional buyers. The active people could be the people we're talking to regularly, trying to convince them that our, our solution or proposition is the way forward. The occasional ones that are ones that are bought in to do part of the buying process. But there's the biggest thing I see, and this is the, the, the most advice I give, or sorry, the, the, the most important piece of advice I give to, to sellers is do two things. Firstly, come up with uh, what I call the uh, ideal DMT, the ideal decision making team. Nearly every organization marketing etc focused on their icp the ID, ideal customer profile mm -hmm. so sector size industry whatever it might be let's focus in and home on them and then you actually say right okay what's your ideal decision making team and, and the question what do you mean by that and i said have you ever looked and investigated and researched post a deal who got involved the typical functional buyer personas across an organization that get involved in the deals that you do, because then you can start to understand. And one of the things I say to people say, once you know, you should proactively engage with those functional personas in your deals as early as possible. Deals get protracted, take longer, become more complex, because guess what? We get to a stage where the technical team and the users saying, yeah, we, we love it. We love it. We love it. And it's great. We think we're forecasting that now that's going to happen. And then suddenly procurement and security and everyone else gets involved and whoa, that now becomes another six, you know, four to six months. So the earlier we get people involved, uh, the better, but it has to start with us understanding of who we should get involved. So that's the first thing I say, have an ideal decision-making team. Secondly, Know how your customers decide and buy. Uh, and I always say, when you want a deal, get someone in your organization, not a salesperson, because you know, we've got low boredom thresholds. We're not the guy. Get someone like a project manager or something like that to say, right, do you mind if we sort of talk through your, your experience that you went through when you started doing your research and da, 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 all the way through to making a decision? You know, 
what information could you find that was helpful? What information couldn't you find that would have been helpful? What questions got asked internally that you, could, you couldn't answer? What objections were raised? Who got involved when? What sort of sign-off? Who, who had to make different sign-offs? And so build a picture on how your customers decide and buy. So you can see where I'm going with that, Martin. If you understand who's going to be involved in the decision and then how they might decide and buy, as sellers, we're now positioned to go, right, okay, I can embrace and engage with these people. And now I can work with marketing and my colleagues to build content, to build a strategy that takes them through, I hate the term, buying journey, the decision-making process, um, takes them through it. Uh, because I think, going back to wonderful people at Gartner, they did some research that said, 62% uh, of buyers would prioritize doing business with companies that differentiate the buying experience. And we were talking earlier about how it's it's difficult to differentiate on a proposition level because there's so many different companies that are in the same space and their collateral is saying, we're the biggest, the best, the fastest, the most reliable. And the buyer goes, right, uh, how, who's telling the truth? What's real? What's relevant? How do I make a decision? So sellers have an opportunity uh, to really come at it from a different perspective, understand the buying, the likely buying team, understanding the challenge of buying, and then work with the buyers through that. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of, um, we were talking about the challenge of sale, weren't we? And I think there's some of the research in there, it says that, you know, one of the, or the, the primary point of differentiation that uh, buyers look for is not price, it's not Feet, you know, bells and whistles. It's actually that buying experience. What are you like to do business with? Do, do you um do you think as well that you know mapping out that ideal uh, decision making team, understanding how they buy, that enables you to be more buyer centric and give a better buying experience because you can then advise them. You know, well, what we've seen from working with previous clients is blah 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 blah. This is what we would recommend for a next step. Do you think that it all kind of just feeds into a better experience, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, so buyer enablement is not something different to sales enablement. It's part of sales enablement. We have to look at it uh, differently because I try to. One of the ways I try to describe this to people and sellers, we can't help but be seller centric. We can't help but be selfish, yeah. um, and because we're focused on numbers, achievement, we've got all sorts of pressure, and it's difficult for sellers. I totally understand that, but a, a bit more thought um, can can be very effective. So when everyone's heard the term, uh, why change? Why now? Why us? Yeah. Okay, so, so a world-renowned sales uh, principle. I try to say, right, what is sales enablement? Sales enablement is why us? Yeah. Buyer enablement is why change, why now? Because we're trying to convince people that they need to change. And that's one of the things I look at when we do our relationship mapping within Boxstep. We take a view on each person in the buying committee. What's their position on change? Um, you know, uh, will they gain from a change or will they feel pain from a change? Because being able to visualize the impact of change across a buying committee helps you know what the next right steps to, are to take with each person. Because sometimes someone might have feel pain. They think the change is a good thing, but they're going to get pain from it because it's going to impact their department or the way they work or whatever it might be. So mm -hmm. focusing on change and going back to... Uh, uh, the challenge sales that you know, Matt Dixon and Ted McKenna wrote a recent book called The Jolt Effect, which I recommend highly. And it talks about indecision. And there is a, a, a principle is that some people, you know, sometimes people think that the status quo is kept because it's the fear of change. What comes out of it is, is something different as well. Of course, fear of change is very important, but it, it's there's a there's a reluctance to make a decision. And that's because of something they termed FOMU. Everyone knows about fear of missing out. FOMU is fear of messing up. Mm. When we're involved in trying to make a buying decision, we have to think about what if I make a bad buying decision, that's on me. That comes back to me. That's going to reflect on me. It could be uh, uh, career defining. You know, Different people in the organization say, oh, Kevin made a real bad mistake bringing that. In. That's why nobody wants to make a decision on their own now. They want to make sure everyone's on board so that if it does go wrong, then they're all to blame, not one individual. So, so yeah, so indecision is a challenge and we have to look at it in two ways. You know, uh, How does change impact the individual member of the buying, buying team? And also, you know, 
do they have any concerns about making a decision? How can we make them feel more comfortable, more confident that they're making the right buying decision? Yeah. No, great, great. Yeah, um, 100% on the same page here. Kevin, could you, um, maybe let's we'll take this in a, in a tactical or practical direction. What can we be doing? But beyond, you know, identifying the, the ideal DMT, um, understanding how they buy, I guess maybe partly, how do we do that? And, and what else can we do as well? Yeah. Well, the, the ideal DMT and how they buy is just your foundational element where you go, okay, now I understand. Once you understand, you've got to do something about it. And there's twofold. Obviously, there's good selling and the engagement and the, the right sort of contextual questioning and sense making across the different buyers. But content, content, you know, we live in a world now that is content hungry, whether it's videos, white papers, webinars, etc. Everybody wants to be fed for learning, for research, whatever. And buyers are exactly the same. You know, buyers before they even engage. And actually, that's one of the most concerning things they're talking about. 70% of buyers now want a rep-free buying experience. So it's because maybe the rep doesn't give them value. I, I'm less worried about that because if I look back and say, well, hold on a moment, a lot of people have very little touch points. You know, if you start to talk about finance procurement, sometimes they can do a lot of that work online. We don't have to have a face-to-face -to, -face to deal with that. So it, it, it's less of a concern, but... What we try to do is if, if we're going to feed that research, then we have to create content that helps. Not helps the why us scenario, that sales enablement, but mm -hmm. content that why change why now. And, you know, I'm I'm sharing really a lot of the research that, that Gartner has done over the period. He's saying, if you think about a buying process, one of the things that we do within Box Step is we have something called outcome enablement plans. A lot of people call them mutual action plans. Um, the whole idea of that is say is they've been around for a long time. They used to be Excel or Word. Now they're sort of digital platform. The idea of being is you can map out the things that need to get done um, with your, your, your customers buying group to sort of help them through. But the problem is they've been used and abused like we do in sales and they've become very much towards driving towards that decision so you can meet the forecasted date. The, the reality is, is that this is where it gets, it sounds a bit fluffy and, and sellers go, what's he talking about? Helping is more effective than selling. People, if you think back in, in life and how much gratitude you've been given by someone you've helped, buyers are no different. If we help them in something, that's a difference maker. And remember that differentiation and proposition can be very difficult. If I then help them in their process, those are brownie points for me when it comes to that. So we think about content. Go back to the bit where we said, right, we understand what happens in a typical buying journey. We have then created a bunch of content and tools that will help you through that. And now that could be in any form, it could be video, white paper, what a blog, whatever it might be. And rather than have, what we tend to do as people, uh, as organiz sales organizations, we have lots and lots of glossy collateral um, that is, very flamboyant description you know and if we give that to buyers and say right pick the bones out of that you know they're not gonna you know people are impatient now they want to get what they need and they want to get it quickly writing content for a specific challenge they might face within their decision making process um could then be applied to the milestone that they're trying to address as they go through this 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 the buying journey so it, it could be a piece of content that could be a it could be a checklist saying, look, here's a checklist we think we'll share with you, all the things you might need to get done. Um, and uh, that's very helpful because, oh, I haven't really thought about that. And because that's what extends a lot of buying processes. People haven't thought about it because the, there's two things that buyers, a lot of buyers have that causes reluctance. They don't have confidence in what they're doing and they don't have experience in what they're doing. Because guess what? They might not have bought what you're selling uh, before. So it's the unknown. So trying to give them tools that say, OK, look, we, we developed this tool. It's not about choosing us. It's about helping you go through a checklist. Da, 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 da. Or here's a benchmark report that you can actually start to check where you're at as an organization against similar organizations who have moved to this type of technology 
anything that is cementing confidence into the buyer's mind is a good thing. And if you're the people that deliver that to them, then you're the people that are going to get the kudos from it. So breaking con down, content down as tools, as documents, as videos into bite-sized chunks that match up against the typical buying journey you can go through is invaluable. I love it. You should come and work for a Lego. You uh, express it all quite well, actually. <laughs> it's uh, No, but it's I true. Sleep and drink it. The guys at Lego will be experts in what they're doing. And, and I would be impressed yeah, yeah, when I yeah. listen to you guys articulate it. No, but it's um, it's so true. I mean, you know, put yourself in in the shoes of of a of a buyer or you know a buying team, and who who are they going to trust more? The you know, if we put this into say like the typical sort of SaaS context of, the, the, are they going to trust the vendor that forces them through a very rigid sales process of you know speak to an SDR, do do a crude discovery, then a demo, you know, go through this like, or are they going to trust the people that say, hey, look here's the checklist, here's, like you say, a benchmark report, here is how similar companies to you typically buy this kind of solution and make that decision, and then, you know, guide them through that. They're, good, they're probably going to trust the latter more, right? And that includes competitive, I, I would imagine that includes comp some competitive information as well, right? Or say, like, you do have options. Yeah, well, yeah totally. But I've never been scared to talk about a competitor. Yeah. Um, and I can say, yeah, you know, they're they're a pretty good platform. They can do all you want, blah, blah. And honesty and helping are two, are two characteristics that buyers like. Um, you know, I, I one of the things we do in our outcome enablement plans, uh, aka mutual action plans, is we include an understanding of all of the business drivers and outcomes and criteria they're trying to achieve. And I did that because I researched with about 200 buyers and said, look, how would you feel if sellers shared their understanding of the, your business drivers with you? They said, well, that'd be bloody refreshing that'd be great we'd see a true sense of a person who's trying to help and, and that would definitely have an impact on us so, so yeah completely of course is we the problem is and, and i don't blame sellers for this uh not all of them anyway is we're ingrained to to get our megaphone out and promote the company we work for and the proposition and and it's the number uh, the, we've gone down a route in the industry of numbers uh over uh, quantity over quality um, and I think that is reflected in why uh, win rates have now dropped well below 20% across industry. You know, I was talking with the legend David Brock last week, and we were talking about back in the day where uh, win rates should be between 40 and 60% because we were rigid in qualification. We only spent time on deals that we could, you know, win because we were a good match for what they're trying to do. And when we did that, we then would have the arm around the shoulder of the customer, helping them go through all these, helping them learn, not coming across like we're seller centric in your face, ramming a square peg into a round hole, which is the pressure that is created in today's sales environment. Um, it, you know, it, it is spiraling, really. The human side of selling is disappearing too much with automation and and too many deals and not enough focus. Biocentric means we truly do that. We walk a mile in our customer's shoes. Love it. That's no, really good stuff. Um, I'll ask you a little bit more about box step in a second, but is there anything else? Any other tips, pointers you can you can give? Well, one of the things I, I say all the time, and, and this is this is going to be for sellers and sales leaders. It's a it's a it's an expression I use a lot to summarize. Say so most salespeople don't know what they need to know, and most sales leaders don't know that they don't know. Because if you start looking in things like CRM, and this isn't me kicking CRM, it's a very useful tool. We become data blind. We look at lots of fields with lots of text, and it doesn't give us any form of clarity. Mm -hmm. When we sort of take it out and try and map it out and visualize it, we can go, "Whoa, blimey, we've got some real gaps in who and what we know." uh we need to fill them so i always say to people is that try to really visualize and break down you know your typical idtm team decision making team and then try and see what you know about them because that can be enlightening i get it all the time people going wow uh box step has really opened up a can of worms here because i can see why so many of our deals are moving to the right in the forecast we don't know enough about them. And, and lo and behold, they do move to the right. So drill down, drill down on who's involved. 
try and understand the dynamics between them um, and then do as much as you can based on that knowledge to help them. Yeah. And uh, what kind of dynamics are we talking? I mean, there's, I suppose there's going to be competing and conflicting priorities as political considerations, I guess, within a, an organisation. Yeah, do you know, it's like uh, set the selling industry is an industry that is full of experts, consultants, trainers, uh, methodologies that probably overcomplicate what we need to do. And I, you know, we're, we're all humans at the end of the day. We are, we are sellers, our customers are buyers, but we're, we've got some own personal elements that we have to worry about the impact of change and then the bigger ends. I just say to people, really focus on, on an organization, what it's trying to achieve, what problems you're trying to solve, who's involved in trying to understand that problem. And map, so really reporting line, of course, is important. Um, politics and you took with politics is more dynamics than politics because sometimes when I say to people map out who might be in conflict and some some sellers think that that means that these two people don't like each other because they're in conflict I say no because it might they might disagree with the way forward or the need to change or whatever it, it's Here's one of the things I say to people nowadays. When people look at Boxstep or CRM or whatever the tools, they say, that's a lot of admin. And I said, because there's a lot of data now and information that we're capturing. Unless we organize that in a way that's going to help us, help the people that are supporting us, and maybe even help the people that, that if we leave, has to pick up the momentum. We have to start focusing about what do we know about the organization and the people. And... Yeah dynamics is just really about influence and politics and trying to get an understanding of course it's subjective opinion it might be hearsay but having some of that and being able to see it at least gives us some clarity on what you might need to do next yeah, um yeah. because people that don't have that clarity would just repeat the same mistakes brilliant brilliant i really so, want to dig deeper with you but i'm conscious of time so um yeah. so i yeah. mean that's why we created Boxstep. It was, you know, I didn't try and, you know, I'm not a technology geek. I couldn't code a line of software. Um, as I told you, I'm, I'm a salesperson through and through, and I have been since <gasps> 1980. Um, some people still go, Christ, my parents were a child then. But, you know, so I've seen it uh, over a long period of time. And what I tried to do is I tried to look at Boxstep as addressing some of the needs of sales teams that are selling in complex sales cycles, whether they're dealing with quite a few people mm. and CRM doesn't really do that not in a visual way at all and, and and it sort of misses the point and we historically we would map out relationship maps on powerpoint we'd do closed plans or mutual action plans on excel word etc cetera, etc cetera. so what i try to say is like you've got this buying committee how do we do it we do, we do it in three ways first of all who do you know mapping out who and what you know about a deal, all sorts of fantastic relationship maps that really help you and the colleagues working on the deal, really drilling down on the buyer profiles, understanding what's important to them, et cetera, et cetera. So that's about who you know and what you know. Then we've got to help them. And we do that through our version of mutual action plans, which I've said repeatedly, outcome enablement plans, because that's a better terminology. Uh, and I th there are a lot of, mutual action plans out there now they are basic simple little checklists but if anyone has a look at how we do it they'll see um how we differentiate from everybody else so we've gone from no to enable okay help the final thing is you win or lose a deal that decision or, or it's a no decision and it was made by a buying committee not enough companies do win loss they don't do enough to learn what they do well what they need to improve upon and we do it across the buying committee. So the more data you can get, the more data points, the greater the picture you can have. So we enable you to get feedback from across the buying committee. And of course, how you word it would determine the level of response you get, uh, the types of forms. And we've developed a little trick, which I won't share today, um, on, on how we do that. Um, so everything is about the buying committee decision making team and you know we plug into salesforce dynamic sugar etc because so, we know we complement it but people use us in a standalone way as well outcome enablement plan i like that i might have to steal that <laughs> well the reason i use it is when you say buyers do they give a toss about the word mutual no action that's the sales word 
If yeah. you set outcome enablement plan, we're saying, look, we're focused on the outcome. We've agreed that you guys are trying to achieve and, and how we can try and enable you to, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a bit more specifically here, uh, just in closing, box step, like what's what's your your ICP or like who, who can you help the most? What's what's like an ideal user use case or user for? Yeah, for anybody not involved in transactional sales. So anybody that's got sales cycles of three months plus and there's multiple people involved mm-hmm. and they, they want to try and you know really sort of focus on them and do everything they can to win the deals. The whole idea, we're trying to help people close deals faster and close more of them. Nothing revolutionary in that. Everyone talks about that, but we can do it in, in, in a way that, that sellers can see. Um, so anyone really that's involved in complex sales, you know, early adopters were the technology industry, but we've moved into construction, media, uh, pharma, uh, all sorts of different areas where people go, Look, we're selling to a, a wide group of people. We want to try and visualize and map that out, that it helps us maybe do the right things and see the path to success. Yeah. So an ICP for us is anything that's not a transactional sale. I know that's broad, um, but uh, yeah, we, we were created to help people in, in complex sales. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, I, I think that um, I think what you're doing is, serve, is serving a really important purpose in, in the broader, you know, like ecosystem or whatever you want to call it. Because as we talked about earlier, you know, there's so much out there that is just focused on that right at the top of the funnel. How do you get that initial meeting with someone? And what you're doing is, I don't want to say it's it's better or it's whatever, but it's there's, there's more yeah. subject to it, right? Yeah, it's a different, different part of the sales cycle, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, every, the, the problem is when, when organizations and sales leaders feel the pinch, they go, right, we've got to get more salespeople, we've got to do more prospecting. So they just want to get a bigger pipeline. Yeah. And, and actually, sometimes there's some things you can do, say, right, if you've got a decent pipeline and well-qualified pipeline, focus on mid to bottom funnel. You know, because I I am forever amazed at the chinks in the armor when I look at people's mid to bottom funnel. Mm. Deals, you know, some some solutions will sell because it's a great solution, it's great price, great reputation. Sellers, what we are supposed to be is the difference maker, where we add value over and beyond the 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 the, the solution, the price, the company reputation. You know, we are the difference maker. That means we get more deals, and that's where mid to bottom funnel management comes in. And that's really where so many teams are weak at. And, and I'm, I'd be incredibly happy to have a conversation with, with anybody that's listening to this that wants to reach out and just give them some general advice because, you know, I've been in the trenches doing what they did. I, you know, as I said, I started selling in 1980. Of course, it was different. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I've evolved. Um, but I spent 20 odd years in exec sales leadership, um, knowing how salespeople are, what they're like, how they work, what, you know, what we need to do to support them. And uh, yeah, it, it's it isn't top of the funnel. Uh, of course, it's difficult to prospect and get a pipeline. But the glaring obvious thing is is to to focus on mid mid to bottom funnel. You know, do do better with what you've got. And the other things where I say is that when we do win loss, we include no decision because when there's no decision, that is an opportunity to revisit. You know, mm-hmm. too many people when it's no decision, they just move on and they they sort of forget about it. And I said, well, what could we have done differently that would have avoided no decision? And that's why we include that in our feedback. Brilliant, brilliant. So uh, where where can people find you, connect with you? LinkedIn. Uh, You know, I'm not a Twitter person. I'm not an Insta, TikTok, anything like that. I'm just LinkedIn. Uh, Or, of course, Kevin at boxstep.com is my email. And it's B-O-X-X-S-T-E-P. Uh, always happy to you know I love talking to people about our industry sales I love learning from other people as well so as much as I like to teach people about my area of expertise I want to learn from other people's area of expertise as well yeah good stuff good stuff well listen thank you Kevin really good chat um I feel like you've got we've only scratched the surface you've got tons tons of insights to offer um but yeah maybe we'll do this again in the future sometime but yeah thanks for coming on and uh thanks everyone for watching No, it was good fun talking with you, Mark. Thanks for inviting me in and hope everyone enjoyed what we had to say. Yeah, no, thank you, mate.